We are getting closer to the end of Nintendo Power's ninth year, and the first first-person shooter on the N64 thus far, with issue 94, or March of 1997. Our cover game this issue is Turok Dinosaur Hunter, beating Goldeneye to the first-person shooter punch by a bit. In the letters column, we have a Letterman-style top 10 list based around Super Mario RPG, and we also have envelope art for two import RPGs from the Super Famicom, which we won't get until significantly later and on different platforms. One Nintendo, but still different platforms. Um, Tactics Ogre and Fire Emblem. In the power charts, we have no new entrants, but a bunch of returning games. Killer Instinct and Donkey Kong Country returning for the Super Nintendo and Donkey Kong Land returning to the list for the Game Boy. We move quickly to our cover game, Turok, Dinosaur Hunter. We have notes on most of the enemies, along with the best weapons for beating them, and notes on every level of the game, but not maps. Again, it feels like Nintendo Power's staff is still figuring out how to do maps of spaces in 3D games. Or I should say maps of three-dimensional spaces in general. This has less been an issue for things like Wave Race, where it's a three-dimensional game, but effectively a two-dimensional course. Turok, being the first first-person shooter on the N64, at least as far as Nintendo Power is concerned, and the first first-person shooter that you have to actively aim with on a console, is figuring a lot of things out. For example, while Doom had a fairly forgiving auto-aim, with the gun generally having to be just a pointed in the proximate direction of the target, Turok doesn't. You have to have a much stronger level of precision. This is even more demonstrated by the bow, which, as with actual bows, has shots that arc. Having some degree of a targeting reticle would make this easier, and ultimately, later first-person shooters that require some degree of precision would provide some way to convey that information to the player, whether through crosshairs or uh, iron sights or something similar. Turok doesn't have that. If I was using a mouse and keyboard, this might be easier, but I'm not, which makes things a bit of a mess. Adding to the issue is the fact of how the N64 controller works. Um, by default, I am aiming with the analog stick and moving with the C buttons, which means I'm working against my muscle, money, muscle memory from years of console first-person shooters, where I am moving with my... Or most modern first-person shooters, you move with your left hand and aim with your right. By contrast, on N64 controller for Turok, you are moving with your right hand and aiming with your left. And using something like the Tribute 64 isn't going to help you here because the analog stick is also on the left side of the controller. It does make for a definite sense here of the developers have ideas on how to do a proper first-person shooter on the N64. Again, strafing is by default with this. Um, with the C sticks, or rather the, or the, the um, C buttons, um, and so they're getting close to mapping the controls and understanding that you want that you're going to want to strafe more than you want to look left or right or outside of aiming, but they're not quite in that seat, sweet spot yet for what we'd expect for a proper console first person shooter. Now we've had some sports games before now, but we have our first EA sports game with FIFA. Uh, Soccer 64 with a whole bunch of general gameplay notes. So I played FIFA 64 using the simple controls since that's what I could find a write-up for as there was no configure uh, creation of the controller in the game itself. So keep that, oh, took that under advisement. So as far as the simple controls go, the game plays fairly oh, intuitive and honestly moves at a very brisk clip. I played through a game on normal and thought the controls were solid enough and didn't feel like I was either being hamstrung or getting the game handed to me due to rubber banding. And the score of the game is appropriate for what you'd get for a soccer game. Low, one nil in this case. The commentary for the game was fairly generic and the crowd noise for it though was great. And there were like some chants which may have even been specific though I'm not really familiar enough with late 90s Major League Soccer to 
say for sure what the Sounders' chance are. I played as Seattle. Um, I couldn't pick the Timbers because they didn't exist yet, and I didn't really start actually paying attention to Major League Soccer until Portland got a soccer team, and then just kept winning championships. We return to Mario Kart 64 with a bunch of notes on the time trial mode, including tips for each of the tracks. There's also a contest to find the best times on the Mario Speedway course. In the classified information column, we got a bunch of cheats for Donkey Kong Country 3, including one that saves after each stage, which is rather nice. We have a preview for Dome 64 with a rundown of the enemies, weapons, and level mechanics written as a in-universe document, but without any level-specific write-up, so I'm holding off for the moment on doing an actual review. The document does set up the idea that Doom 64 is a sort of sequel to the original Doom and Doom 2 as well. So there's that. We also have additional coverage for Killer Instinct Gold, giving combos for each of the various fighters. In Epic Center News, which is still back, we are getting a second print run of Lufia 2, which is a pretty quick turnaround considering how recently it came out, along with a blurb on BS Zelda for the Satellaview. Nothing on Radical Dreamers yet, uh, which is, as of this recording, topical because of the release of it as part of the Chrono Cross Radical Dreamers collection. We have a preview of Earthbound 64 with, tr with trial renders and concept art, although this game does not ultimately come out. Also, some additional more in-depth coverage of Harvest Moon this issue with more involved advice on how to plan your schedule both for the early game and then later on after you've gotten married because you have less time available for you once you have gotten hitched. And in the Epic Strategy column, we are revisiting Earthbound with a whole bunch more tips for the Super Nintendo game, the one that is actually out at this time and is currently available as of this recording on the Nintendo Switch Online. Anyway, Link's Awakening is getting a reprint, so they are rerunning the guide, more or less, with some stuff removed for space. There's a Disney animated film out, an adaptation of Hunchback of Notre Dame, and we have a really super basic mini game collection for the Game Boy for it. And actually, I'm... I know this is a fairly light issue, but I'm giving this a miss, because this is... This is actual shovelware, and it's actually super disappointing considering the Disney track record, even for the movie licensed games up to this point, has been rock solid. Aye. Anyway, the big thing this issue, though, is the 1996 Nintendo Power Awards, and we have the ballot and nominees. So, as is normal, it is time for my picks for each award. So... Rather, that I'll just kind of lump the ones together under common the ones that are for multiple nominees under the awards that I'm picking them for. I am choosing Shadows of the Empire for best soundtrack and best graphics. I really like what they did with some of the level environments there, especially for the uh, train levels. And also best transportation with the speeder bike and seeker missiles for best combat item and well, Imperial Stormtroopers for best baddie. I'm voting for Lufia 2 for best story and best ending. Um, very emotional and quickly how it ties into the first game. And honestly, best Super Nintendo game overall. Mario 64 is my pick for best challenge, best play control, and best N64 game. And Mario's backflip under coolest move. I think this is probably one of my preferred ex uh, executions of the backflip, especially compared to how it shows up in the new Mario Brothers games and the Crying Baby Penguin for Most Annoying. For Most Innovative, I'm going for SimCity 2000. It's a very decent execution of the game, and it's very clear how much they're trying to push the Super Nintendo to its absolute limits. I do wish the game had supported the um, Super Nintendo mouse. And Tetris Attack for Best Multiplayer and Easiest to Learn and Toughest to Master. Madden 97 for Best Sports Game. Eh, not the options there weren't great. Street Fighter Alpha for best fighting game is one that really big of games that push the N6, the uh, Super Nintendo to its limits. Does a really great job there. The That's Gotta Hurt Award goes to for Baraka's Fatality for Mortal Kombat Trilogy. 
um, which is the one where he stabs the enemy on his blades, holds him up, and just lets him slide down. It is, for all the over-the-top stuff in the Mortal Kombat games, it's probably one of the more actually brutal um, feeling of the fatalities. Best hero goes to Kirby, and best Game Boy game goes to Kirby's Black Ball. Super Mario RPG gets gets uh, funniest game and worst villain for Smithy. Um, we didn't really have much of a better options, unfortunately, for the RPG villains. Anyway, Beat the Boss column is next, and speaking of Super Mario RPG, we have strategies for all of the bosses in the game. So, something to hang on to while you are making your way through it, if you're deciding to play through the game through or through it with, for lack of a better term, contemporary resources as opposed to more modern facts. In Counselor's Corner, we have a bunch more tips for Mario 64. It's probably one of the Mario games that have the most tips and tricks related to it because of the nature of how it is structured. It's interesting to see how much sim it will get similar coverage once we start getting into Banjo-Kazooie and uh, Donkey Kong 64. Again, in the now playing column, we have no also rans, which is going to make my best of the rest episode interesting, considering that we're skidding into the meat of 1997 and it's still pretty light outside of the re releases. And finally, in Pack Watch, we have featured coverage for Zelda 64 and Star Fox 64. I think if the issue is for this month, FIFA Soccer 64. Now, Turok plays well enough that I might consider it making my uh, consider making it my pick of the issue, and certainly might consider revisiting it. But I didn't bring this up in the review for portion because this is a me, very much a me thing. It I I got motion sick. It took a while for me to get motion sick. I made it through most of the first level before that happened. Um, and it's not something that's unique for Turok. Lots of first-person shooters from around this time, even Doom, emotion sickness. Um, but that point did come, and that makes it something where, like, I really wholeheartedly recommend it for that reason. Um, and honestly, like, FIFA Soccer 94, I worked for me a bit more. It also leads to the other thing. Um, as far as we're recommending the N64 version of Turok, is there are PC ports of Turok now. You can play this game with a mouse and keyboard and adjust all sorts of settings and feel to that sort of have it in 16x9 as opposed to 4x3 on stuff. So, and they'll even the ability possibly to save whenever, which gives it an additional edge over the original console re console release. I think even that the PC port has gotten console versions on like, you know, um, Xbox, the Xbox platform and possibly um, PlayStation platform, which again gives the opportunity to hit with a dual analog stick, having moving and firing work the way you muscles expect it to with movement on the right, on the left side, aiming on the right side, as opposed to other way around on the or control. So ultimately those options are available and probably a better way to do it. Um all things can Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.